Hello, my name is Dr. Terry Day. I am a professor, vice chair, and director of the Division of Head and Neck Oncologic Surgery at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. I am excited to have participated in the HPV Roundtable as representative of the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance, for which I serve as president of the Board of Directors. I currently work as a head and neck oncologic surgeon, which primarily involves removal of tumors and cancers of the head and neck region. I am also an advocate for raising awareness of the link between the human papillomavirus, commonly referred to as HPV, and oropharyngeal cancers, or cancers of the head and neck. The CDC estimates that more than 11,000 cases of oropharyngeal cancer attributed to HPV will be diagnosed each year. This is a cancer that is increasing in incidence with severe health implications. Preliminary research has shown that we can prevent this cancer through HPV vaccination. Let's quickly cover the HPV basics. HPV stands for human papillomavirus. There are more than 200 such viruses according to the National Cancer Institute. Each virus in the group is given a type number such as HPV-16 or HPV-18. Some HPV types cause warts or papillomas, which are non-cancerous tumors. About 75% of HPV types can cause warts on the skin. The other 25% of HPV types affect mucosal areas, including the mouth or genital cavities. These are the types of high-risk HPV that can cause cervical cancer, vaginal, vulvar, anal, penile, and oropharyngeal cancers. It is important to understand that HPV is common, so common that nearly all men and women will be exposed in their lifetime. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates a lifetime risk greater than 90% of men and 80% of women, assuming they are sexually active during their lives. Most people never know they have HPV, and it usually resolves on its own. However, in some people, HPV leads to cancer. Unfortunately, there's no way to know if an infection will develop into cancer. HPV vaccination will protect most preteens against both low and high risk HPV types before they are exposed to the virus. Vaccination shows greater effectiveness at younger ages. We know from studies that vaccination in early teens prevented many more advanced cervical precancers than vaccination of older teens and young adults. Preteens also demonstrate a stronger immune response compared to older teenagers. Also, we know that preteens have three times as many preventive visits as teens, so we need to capitalize on these visits to make sure tweens are protected early on. Here you can see the various types of cancers caused by HPV broken out by sex. Women are on the left, and men are represented on the right. Compare the largest pie slices. Amongst women on the left, Cervical cancer is by far the most common, causing 56% of HPV-related cancers. Notice that only 10% of female HPV cancers are located in the oropharynx. Amongst men, however, a staggering 78% of HPV-related cancers are oropharyngeal, as shown on the right. That's a third of all HPV-related cancers. Let's focus on where HPV most affects the lining of the mouth and throat. This area is referred to as the oropharynx. The areas outlined in green comprise the oropharynx. This includes a soft palate, which is a soft part of the roof of the mouth and back, the uvula, the tonsils, the base of the tongue, and the back of the throat right behind the soft palate. The areas shaded light purple on both graphics are the areas most affected by HPV, the base of the tongue and the tonsils. Dentists or oral hygienists may identify HPV-associated concerns during dental exams, and increasingly many dentists are promoting HPV vaccination. Physicians and advanced practice providers may identify HPV-associated concerns during routine medical physical exams, and may also promote HPV vaccination. Think about how important this part of our anatomy is to breathing, swallowing, and talking. The oropharynx is a critical part of our ability to communicate. What is it like to have HPV oropharyngeal cancer? Let's hear from Scott, who was diagnosed at age 49. I remember Dr. Nathan um, saying to me, Scott, it's gonna be tough, push through. Whatever you do, push through. It's going to get tough, but just do it. 
My name's Scott, I'm 56 years old. I was diagnosed with um, head and neck cancer, HPV related cancer, when I was 49 years old. She found it at the base of my tongue and she said, I said, well, cut it out. And she said, we can't, it's too far gone, uh, stage three, almost stage four, that I would have to remove three quarters of your tongue to get to it. I would have to break both sides of your jaw to, to open your mouth wide enough to get in. And I'm a college professor and I live by speaking and that would have ended my career. But she said the good news was that HPV um, cancer was very responsive to chemo and radiation. So she said, let's try that first. And so that's what we did. So far, it's been successful. It was a 50 minute uh, radiation treatment a day. The, the worst part really was the chemotherapy. I had four or five treatments and each time I had a, a treatment, it was like every two weeks, I ended up in the hospital. My jerk was 12 hours. And so, and then they, I had to stay in the hospital until I kind of recovered from it. The first time I think it was three days in the hospital. My last one I, I was in over almost two weeks trying to recover. And that, that was the hardest part. Um, they, they joke about something called chemo brain. Um, I couldn't remember my wife's name. I think providers, uh, pediatricians and things, should um, at an early age um, bring up to parents of, of young males and females that uh, HPV virus is, is out there. Um, the chances of, of their sons contracting it at some point in their life is probably greater than than we wish it would be, but it's, it's out there, and that here's a way to prevent um, long-term uh, issues such as uh, HPV-related cancers. Scott's personal story tells the toll of this disease years after initial exposure. If we look at the greater trends of this disease among men and women, we see that the number of cases of HPV-associated oropharyngeal cancer has grown. Incidence rates have increased among men in all age groups. As you can see from this graph, these cases largely occur after age 50. Incidence rates also have increased among women 55 and older, but clearly at lower rates than men. Note the bottom two trend lines for how few cases there are during the years after adolescence between the ages of 20 to 49. This is a good reminder that it takes years for the HPV to present as cancer. Let's look at the impact of HPV on different population groups. Solid colored columns represent women and striped columns represent men. What strikes you about this graph? In every group, men are disproportionately impacted by oropharyngeal cancer. Men are around four times more likely to develop this cancer than women. In terms of population groups, incidence rates are highest on average among white men as compared to other groups. How is oropharyngeal cancer diagnosed? There is no recommended screening test at this time to find oropharyngeal precancers. While precancerous lesions may be observed in pap testing, the same is not true for this cancer. Getting a sample from the affected areas would be challenging given the location of the tonsils and the base of the tongue. It's much more difficult than performing a strep throat test. If there are any symptoms, patients may present with a persistent sore throat or a neck mass, such as swelling they notice while shaving. This is a symptom that the cancer has spread to the nearby lymph nodes already. Other symptoms may include earaches, hoarseness, enlarged lymph nodes, pain when swallowing, and unexplained weight loss. Some persons have no signs or symptoms. How do we know that HPV vaccination can help prevent these cancers? The National Cancer Institute partnered with Costa Rican researchers on a clinical trial to test the effectiveness of HPV vaccination on oropharyngeal cancer. Over 7,000 women ages 18 to 25 received the bivalent HPV vaccine, which protects against HPV type 16 and 18. Four years after vaccination, women who received the vaccine were 93% less likely to have oral HPV which is known to be associated with cancer of the oropharynx. 
Researchers noted that this vaccine is expected to prevent the majority of oral infections and will therefore likely contribute to a reduction in HPV-associated cancers of the oropharynx. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends that boys and girls begin HPV vaccination at age 11 or 12. The vaccine series may be offered as early as age 9. The series should be completed by their 13th birthday. As a trusted health care provider, your recommendation carries weight with the family decision makers. In focus groups and surveys with moms, a clinician's recommendation is the number one reason parents decide to protect their children with vaccination. The recommendation is as easy as your preteen needs three vaccines today to protect against meningitis, HPV cancers, and pertussis. Bundling HPV vaccination in with other adolescent vaccines normalizes it as a cancer prevention vaccine, just as the other vaccines prevent against other diseases. I hope that you now have the information you need to confidently recommend HPV vaccination to your 11 to 12 year old patients and their parents. You can also help inform your colleagues about the connection between oropharyngeal cancer and HPV. I'd welcome your help in making sure I treat fewer cancer patients in the future. Remember, HPV vaccination is cancer prevention. For more information, please visit the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable website.